Welcome to Vice and Easy, your podcast for all things Miami Vice, with your host, Marina. Hello, and welcome back to Vice and Easy. I hope you all enjoyed our Vice Tea special last week, and I hope to have a few more in the works. Uh, with the feedback from Instagram and YouTube, it seems like our next episode will be focused on the onset tension between Edward James Olmos and Don Johnson. So that should be a good one. So I'll start digging up some dirt for that next Vice Tea special. But... This week, let's get back to the recaps. This week, we're breaking down Season 2, Episode 5, The Dutch Oven. In this Trudy-centric episode, while Trudy and Sonny are embroiled in an internal affairs investigation, Trudy reaches out to an ex-flame whose friends might be on the other side of the law, putting Trudy in a compromising position. Now, this episode kicks off in a really fun way. We hear Women by Foreigner playing in the background while Trudy is putting on some face paint. And we cut to all these different kind of club girls and kids outside of this club called Dynamo. It's not quite the same. Remember that three episode arc where Miami Vice would open in like the slums or the red light district of Miami? Kind of like this, but they jazzed it up a little bit. I love all the outfits. Honestly, I think this episode has the most media I've ever grabbed for an episode. Um, because as you'll see later, we have one of our favorite re recurring guest stars, Giancarlo Esposito, coming back. So I just had to take pictures of everybody. We have the super cute girl with the studded choker smoking. I made that into a gift. The cutoff electric shirt. Judy, uh, Trudy in the wig. Everyone just looks like a million bucks before this all goes down. <laughs> Before we get to actually the bus that's going down or the the deal, Trudy and Crockett look at each other in such a way that I figured they would hook up at the end of this episode. Obviously, I've already seen the episode. I know they didn't. But go look at this gif I made. Like, totally bedroom eyes at one another. And it gets a little spicier later on the episode. And it is funny. So Miami Vice Art, a really great account on Instagram with amazing content. They posted that the writers, I guess, had kind of toyed with the idea in this episode of Castillo and Trudy hooking up. <laughs> Sorry to laugh. And then when you see Trudy and Sunny interact, it's like a whole different world. Like, I don't understand how the writers thought that Edward James Olmos <laughs> and Olivia Byrne had any chemistry because then you put her and Don Johnson together in a scene and it's like, <gasps> like, I need a cigarette and a cold shower. So just very funny. <laughs> so let's get down to this deal since this is what we're all here for. Tubbs and Zwitek walk into the bar where, again, I took a picture of this gentleman wearing what appears to be like a baseball tee crop top. Amazing. This episode is wilding. Please enjoy because I'm going to be posting a ton of media from this episode. So Tubbs and Zwitek go to meet this guy at the bar. One of them has to stay behind at the bar and wait while one of them goes to the back to make the deal. Therefore, Tubbs is the one going to the back office. This back room is wild. I've been to the back room of many a sketchy bar, but the murals and the colors, and there's a gentleman on the payphone. Really fun, charismatic, charming gentleman with a giant mustache. His name is Matthew Coles, rest in peace. Towing around basically tells Tubbs that the phone is for him. Tubbs then gets dragged into the room, which is equally as widely decorated, quote unquote, with graffiti everywhere. There's a guy tied up at the desk. So I think we all know where this is going. It's a ripoff. Easy, neighbor. Let's not make this personal. This is just business. Inside, please. What is going on? It's a ripoff. And they're outside the club listening, but they're not acting on it yet until Tubbs gives them the signal. So after Tubbs is ripped off, the other guy's still sitting there, taped up, tied up, and gagged. Then Tubbs says something akin to, security stinks here. And I guess that is the code 
they go after. And this music sounds very, very, very familiar. You might recognize it from Heart of Darkness, season one, episode two. The security stinks. Right? That is like the exact same, almost sounds like Heartbreaker by Pat Benatar demo. And so with that, with the code word, the Vice team on the races, Sonny and Trudy hop into the Ferrari, go chasing after the mustached guy who ripped them off, driving a sweet Trans Am. The one thing I really didn't like about this chase would be super uncomfortable, and I know it's all stunt driving, where Sonny drives on the wrong side of the road towards two motorcyclists who then have to go around the car. It just made me very uncomfortable. Please check for motorcyclists and bikes when you're driving. That just made me very, very, very anxious to watch. So they actually pull into an alley. They're able to corner the Trans Am, but this is where it gets a little sticky. So like I said, I'm setting the scene. Dark alley, we have the Trans Am can't really go anywhere. Then we also have the spider with Trudy and Sonny. They get out of the car. Crockett does say, freeze Miami Vice. Our mustache fellow in the Trans Am opens fire. As Sonny is going behind the dumpster to find cover, Trudy shoots him four times. So the reason I'm trying to explain this is because I'm worried I'm missing details too, is that this is what's going to be investigated by internal affairs. So just trying to give you like a little bit of backstory about what had transpired and then they're going to break it down more in later scenes. But just to give you a little summary. And you can tell while watching this because every other episode, Crockett and Tubbs shoot a bunch of people. No big deal. But after he shot, Crockett kind of looks surprised, goes over, checks for a pulse and tells Trudy he's dead, and then we cut to intro. So that kind of feels a little bit weird, because in all these episodes, they have just been opening fire willy-nilly, never cared, so we know this is setting up for something different. And so after the intro, we're still back on the scene. Crockett is kind of explaining what happened to Castillo. Trudy is explaining what happened to Gina. Gina asks if she wants company tonight. Trudy declines that, says she'd rather be at home. And then there's a very nice scene. I don't know why I don't have a clip of this. I'm so sorry. I have 22 other clips, but not this one. I couldn't get the technology right. Where Crockett looks at Trudy and just says, thanks, partner. And then they go their way for the night. And so we cut to Trudy's beautifully decorated apartment where she's playing the piano with perfectly manicured fingers. We see her reach for a very funky stylized telephone. Uh, Please look at a picture in the gallery. We don't know who she's calling, but the next scene, we see an incredibly handsome man belting his heart out. So that handsome crooner, real name Clavant Derricks, is actually David, who we learn is Trudy's ex-boyfriend, because we see her crying alone at the table, and they have a very sweet, well, I'll say bittersweet, conversation when he sees her. How have you been? Mostly pretty good. There's some songs I don't sing anymore, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. There's songs that I don't listen to. Hey, David. Well, what you keeping to yourself over here? <laughs> I am Adonis. Oh, ain't you just? <laughs> <laughs> now, does that voice sound familiar to you? Because that is a recurring guest star, amazing actor Gus Frings, aka real life Giancarlo Esposito. This time, on Miami Vice, he is playing Adonis, a very dapper, charming incredibly wildly appropriately dressed for the mid 80s that whole description kind of came out a jarbled mess but you know where i'm going seeing how he's dressed and how he's playing this character it makes me so 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 happy it is also funny i don't want to say funny but 
I will give credit to the Miami Vice writers. Well, they'll break your heart one episode and then it is just fun, wild excess the other. You know, we do need balance. And the balance I needed this week is Adonis being Adonis. You see, uh, I'm not just pretty. I'm the candy man. Yeah, whatever you say. Oh, I'm in love already. Speaking of love, Trudy and David are reunited, and it's the 80s, so of course they're in silk sheets, talking about the past and how good they were together, and they're hinting at getting back together. And so while we leave that conversation, we go visit Crockett playing gin at an old folks home and his outfit is actually amazing because he is able to work three different colors and look totally great and not too excessive or clashing in any of them so he's wearing a canary yellow blazer a fuchsia purple i'm not sure how to describe this color it's like a very pink purple shirt obviously unbuttoned and then light blue pants But yes, he gets the call during his gin game. (laughs) And he's got some formidable opponents, I'll tell you that. Sonny, the phone, the man's waiting. See, Max, that's your problem. That's why none of these guys will play with you because you don't play fair. A nice boy. No card sense, but a nice boy. And what he means by doesn't play fair, so I don't know the rules of gin at all, so... I'm the last person to explain this, but I'll just tell you exactly what happened. Basically, Max, the older gentleman, was holding kings, quote, this late in the game, which annoyed Sonny. Don't know what that means. However, that call that Sonny received means that it's time to meet with internal affairs. And before we get to the serious stuff, let me get to the superficial stuff. Trudy and Crockett are both wearing different shades, but they're both wearing yellow and purple. Just kind of think that's interesting, especially going into an investigation where your superiors are breaking down every single thing you did to wear colors that are associated with royalty. Kind of interesting. Maybe I'm just reading way too much into it, but I thought that was interesting. And as their interrogation with internal affairs starts, Crockett naturally smoking a cigarette. I got a great gif of him reaching for the ashtray. And actually that I don't judge him on if... I were being questioned by my overseeing body, what have you, in my career. I would also be pretty nervous in lending up a cigarette. As someone who works in the service industry, I have been promoted. I have been given a raise. Lots of things have happened while I've been taking a smoke break. So, you know, I get it. Anything to kind of quell your nerves. Internal affairs is not a big fan of Crockett, to say the least. They refer to him as a cowboy. They bring up his record. And this is where I think it gets a little iffy. I They're obviously very, a ton of shootings. Every single episode of Miami Vice, someone is shot and killed. But if you're going on the overall average, they are dealing with people who are already in organized crime, therefore 100% have weapons on them or will have goons with weapons on them. So they are skewing the numbers on average. These are not, you know, dirty cops shooting somebody at a traffic stop. This is a little bit different, but I do appreciate that they are questioning what else could have been done to prevent this from happening, which I think is a very important conversation to have. Crockett, however, is not having any of it. I'm a street cop, Gallo. I don't sit on my fat rump all day like you Alpha Hotels. Alpha Hotels took me a second, but then I realized A, Alpha, Hotel, H. So you can insinuate what he's uh, saying right there, but I thought that was really funny. Internal Affairs does bring up some good points. They were both dressed undercover and even though they did identify themselves as police, I don't recall them showing their badges, so again, but then again, they were shot at first. You know, like Rambo has taught us, they drew first blood. So I understand that Internal Affairs really has to get the true answer and see what else could have been done and then they start grilling Trudy. 
the suspect called the play, he wouldn't let it go down any other way. He wouldn't? Well, who the hell put him in charge? You're the cop, he isn't. You're the one who makes the decisions, not the suspect. I was doing what was necessary to protect myself and my partner. And there were no options available. Now you're getting the picture. Let me see if I do. You got this guy plugged up in an alley. Backup units are seconds away. And you can't chill it down. Let him see the blues and reds. Let him know what he's up against. Then if he wants to wage war, you did everything you could. School's out. Tell me, Officer Chaplin, if you had backed off, would the suspect have gotten away? And if you had backed out, would he be alive now or what? So it's after that kind of questioning, Crockett gets fed up, basically tells them if they want to press formal charges, they can. But until then, they are out of there. Takes Trudy, drives her home, and on the way home, he does reassure her that she made the right decision and that there was only, quote, one play. And then when Trudy's back at the precinct, she looks gorgeous. She's obviously going undercover with this long sleeve um, V-neck leopard print dress, her hair all big with these gorgeous earrings. And she and Castillo actually have a serious conversation. He wants her to take time off. She resists. She doesn't want to. Um, and he is being compassionate, but it does seem that she is being treated a little bit differently, in my opinion. And of course, I'm coming at this from a bias because I've been in male dominated workforces where if I'm having a bad day. It's a very big deal, even though I'm the most smiliest bartender on the planet. But, you know, someone can do lines of blow off a check presenter and give away tons of free liquor and it's not a big deal. So I am a little biased in this where I see that she is being treated differently than Crockett and Tubbs. And again, I know this was 40 years ago. So women have come a long way in the workplace, but we don't see this kind of concern directed towards Crockett or Tubbs when they're dealing with the aftermath of opening fire. And I will not play devil's advocate, but I will say that Trudy, as an undercover sex worker is dealing with a very different type of danger every day rather than gunfire. She's not exposing herself to automatic weapons the same way that Crockett and Tubbs are, but she is exposing herself to different kinds of danger and different kinds of weapons and being sexually abused in her line of undercover work. So maybe that is where the concern is coming from, that she has not had to discharge her weapon the same way that Crockett and Tubbs have. Um, or maybe they just need a storyline and they're like, hey, let's give the, uh, let's do this with Trudy. So that's where I'm coming from. 100% I am biased watching this episode as a woman, <laughs> but you know, I'll try to enjoy it for what it is. And then so we cut to Trudy in that gorgeous leopard print dress, Gina in a pink polka dot blouse tucked in with that impossibly small waist with some silver pants. They're walking in broad daylight when this gentleman calls them over and contact warning, get your kids out of the room for this one. Let me get this straight. You want to pay me 50 bucks to have sex with those children, is that right? 60, if I can watch. So she instructs them to pull into the alley, and as they disclose that they're police officers and begin the process, Trudy gets a little bit rougher than usual, remarking Gina to say, you know, like, what's going on? What's wrong? Calm down. You know, if they don't follow the arrest procedures properly, the whole case could be thrown out. So while I sympathize with Trudy having to deal with perverts all day, there are procedures that need to be in place. We cut from that to the one of the wildest decor jobs I've ever seen in Miami Vice. Please go look at the gallery if you are not driving. The open concept bathroom that just kind of has glass built around it but not all the way then you have like a blue porthole lit from behind then you have kind of like a closet that's built out from the house from the wall 
please go look at this. It is wild. Oh, and it gets better. There are other pictures of this apartment that I am just going nuts over. Trudy looks like a million bucks. She's wearing a watermelon pink strap dress with a big black belt and they're going off to a party and this party surprise surprise full of drugs full of partying full of debauchery and then we have another live musical performance And that song is called King of Babylon, performed live, the second live performance of the episode by David Johansson. And so at this party, like I said, please go look at the pictures. There are people handing each other joints in like a very weird way that it just seems better to just do it yourself. Shotgunning weed or crack, who knows what they're smoking, doing coke out of what looks to be like a Capri sunbag, just a wild excessive party. And of course, who else is there but our new friend Adonis. I ain't no credit dentist. And you gotta pay to play. You dig? You owe me, man. While Adonis is conducting business in this amazing purple suit, yeah, he's not playing. He's roughing up the guy who doesn't have any money to pay. Trudy and David walk in at the same time. Trudy, who's already kind of expressed to David that she doesn't feel comfortable at this party, given what she does and given that everybody is doing illegal drugs in front of her, they leave. Then the next morning, Trudy goes over to Crockett's boat, the same fight as dance, to discuss what's going on while giving him a massage. It's quite a scandalous scene, in my opinion. This is not how I interact with my coworkers, but then again, my coworkers don't look like Don Johnson. And she confides in him that she doesn't believe that David himself is dirty, but that his friends are. And then in this next clip, they get a little bit more into how they're struggling with keeping their professional and their private life separate. What line is that? You mean the line that uh, between being on duty and off duty? The line that marks that gray area between being a cop and having friends that use and deal? Is that the line you're talking about? The only one. Yeah. The only time I find that line is usually when I'm over it. And speaking of drug dealing friends, we're checking in with Adonis with this amazing footage <laughs> of Adonis making a deal with this guy who is straight out of the 70s. What looks to be like a Panama hat. It's not quite a fedora. Correct me if I'm wrong. Electric blue blazer. Soft blush pink dress shirt unbuttoned adorned with gold chains i <laughs> i had to make a gif of this because i like squealed with excitement once i saw this guy on my screen and then less exciting but he stops by this house while tubs is outside doing surveillance it appears to be the same house from whatever works the same house where they have the shootout just filmed at night versus in the daytime. I'm going to do a little bit of recon and see if it is just go through my pictures, but it did kind of pique my interest a little bit. I was like, oh, Michael Mann, Michael Mann casting and Michael Mann uh, location scouting. I love it. Very loyal man. Then I cannot get over David's apartment. So his bedroom, it's kind of like a junior one bedroom where there's just a wall and they've cut out this jagged piece of wall so you can get into the bedroom with neon lights above or like neon fixtures above the bed. I cannot. And <laughs> she looks gorgeous in this beautiful silk floral dress. And she asks him about Adonis and he says that he's just a friend but that he's not involved. You know, that he, Adonis does what he does, but David is personally not involved. And then David proposes that they take a romantic little getaway. Very cute. And so after that, we are back at the precinct where Trudy gives her coworkers a little bit more insight into her relationship with David and why she's feeling so conflicted. Serious is it between you and David? Serious enough. 
I care about the guy. He's not the kind of guy we usually meet. You mean he's not a cop? No offense, but there are other people in the world to date besides police officers. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like this is going to be in your face as long as you date him. It's the people around him. But it's only that. I think they use these parties to distribute. The dealing's heavier and the mounts are too large. One dealer? Yeah. A guy named Adonis. I like that. <laughs> the way that Tubbs says that, I love it. <laughs> and so the conclusion of this discussion is that they've dug up a little bit more dirt on Adonis and they want to get him to make a deal with Trudy so she can catch him. And this prompts an amazing fade screen montage. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go to the gallery where you can see Trudy taking a pensive walk down the street and then later on the beach as flashbacks of her relationship with David and Adonis and all that and the shooting come back, but it's like a fade screen so you can see both shots in one picture. Please check it out. And even better, this is the music playing in the background. So after her pensive walk slash fade screen montage, Trudy has come to a decision. She goes to the club that she initially met David while he was performing at. This time she's not there to see David. She's there to see Adonis. And she tells Adonis about a deal with a guy in the marina. It's sunny. Surprise, surprise. So Adonis is a little bit skeptical, but she basically says it's a one-time score. And Adonis says, quote, Adonis can deliver. Love it. And so with that, Trudy takes Adonis, who is decked out in this amazing, shiny, gunmetal, dark gray suit, to meet with the guy in the marina. However, Sonny and Adonis butt heads a little bit. I can deliver, Jack. I'm just checking you out. A lot of cops around. Excuse me, baby, but this is the nature of the beast. So, when can you raise the money? Look, Jack, I'm ready to buy right now, tonight, tomorrow, but I'm not waiting around. Okay, anticipate my return. I'll be back soon, real soon. Cool, dude. I will point out this is the second episode in a row where we see Elvis receiving um, a fun spray shower on the St. Vitus dance. And so as Adonis leaves, after quote unquote this deal not really been made, we see why. So Adonis goes back to the pink house in question. Tubbs is again doing surveillance. There's a bit of an argument about money where basically Adonis doesn't have enough money to pay back his suppliers to get enough coke to make this deal with Crockett. So we get a little bit more insight as to what's going on. Adonis doesn't have enough money to get enough coke, therefore he can't do the deal to make enough money to pay back his suppliers. So it's a little bit of a sticky situation that he's gotten himself into. So Tubbs now has that insight and that recon with him in his pocket. And as they go back to the precinct, they kind of discuss the plan, what's going down. So. Castillo says that the internal affairs report is back and that Trudy, Sonny are off the hook. Trudy says that she's going to take time off after the bust and Castillo suggests that she goes now and she gets a little bit defensive. She really wants to be a part of the bust, which in my opinion is 100% fair because there wouldn't be a bust if it wasn't for her in the first place. And so it's going down. She and Adonis meet up However, remember how I said that Adonis was kind of in a sticky situation where he didn't have enough money to pay back his suppliers to get enough coke to make the deal with Crockett? So, unfortunately, he's cutting the coke with what appears to be baby powder or laundry detergent in order to get the volume to where it needs to be to make this deal. And now it is way worse with people cutting coke with fentanyl. So, PSA, please be careful out there. And so Trudy and Adonis are talking a little bit more. And I will want to bring up before I play this next clip, David, her boyfriend, has no idea this is going on. They're planning on going on vacation next week. That's why she wanted time off. So this is all happening behind David's back. See, power is giving people what they want. 
and making them realize they gotta come to you to get it. But I got a feeling that you know that. And you're just using him, same as you're using me. <laughs> Maybe you and me can do a little bit more than business. Okay, while I'm not surprised he's proposing what he's proposing, given that we've seen his lack of moral standards, the fact that this is not uncommon, like that you break up with somebody and like their best friend or childhood friend like kind of comes into the framework. It's just like, wow, it really do be your own people because this is not uncommon. Okay, back to the episode. That slam we heard is Crockett entering the door and then Adonis stashing the baby powder slash laundry detergent in the briefcase to hide it as there's this mountain, 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 mountain of cocaine on this tray. <laughs> like, is it a bulk food store? Is Crockett supposed to scoop this up and put this into bags himself? Or like, I understand that he wants to test it, but like, <laughs> this is hilarious. It is such a funny visual. And then so as Crockett takes a little tester, a little test tube to test the coke, Trudy reveals that Adonis is under arrest. Oh, baby. You're a cop? April Fool. And so with that, another hilarious scene where Adonis takes the giant tray of cocaine, throws it in Crockett's face, turns around, and Roundhouse kicks the table in front of Trudy out of the way and starts taunting her. She already has her gun drawn at this point. She says she will shoot, keeps taunting her, keeps taunting her. Crockett, I guess, off that monster high, comes back, knocks him out, arrests him. What I also do appreciate about Adonis is that his see-through mesh, maybe it's not mesh, his see-through, maybe it's mesh, his see-through clear shirt kind of matches the cocaine, so you have to give it up for a dealer that matches his product. And it's funny, so Crockett has like all this white powder on his face, super funny. This next scene, though, actually is pretty poignant. I really appreciated where the writers went with this. So David, arriving with his band, comes to see what's transpired at the club. Again, he has no idea that any of this is going on. And tells Trudy exactly how he feels. You take my trust and you turn it on my friends? Adonis is not your friend. No. Who is you? You lied? Cheated? used me. I've never known you, have I? What do you think I have? A switch in my head? I can just turn on or off? You took me to that party and you threw it up in my face. I brought you, not this damn police force, not your damn badge. I'm a cop! It's not what I do, it's what I am. You got no soul, no honor. So I am going to throw it out there that I don't think any of us were really expecting that ending. However, I do think that it brings up a lot of good points that we can break down. So I do think David is 100% right that why would he trust Trudy after what he did to his friend? And while his friend was obviously involved in illegal activities, she did not have to do what she did. I think that Trudy did what she did and went after Adonis to make a bus in order to get a win for herself. Um, The way that she was treated in the force after this investigation, I don't think it would happen to Crockett or Tubbs in the same way. And I do empathize with being a woman in a male-dominated workforce where if you are human or show a little bit of emotion, you get treated very differently than when a man does it. And the standards I know are different for every single workplace. I'm not comparing anything, but I do think that David is right, that he invited her, not what she does. And while I do appreciate that she is a good, honest cop, That kind of sentiment can be used by bad actors to justify 
very bad behavior. So unfortunately, that mindset has not really aged well. And we will explore this a little bit later on in the series with kind of separating who you are and what you do. And I understand when you go undercover, you lose a little bit of that as well. But I do think that's a very interesting ending where basically Trudy got read in a way that I don't think she wanted to be read. And, well, personally, I think that Trudy should have just hooked up with Crockett because they look very good together. They have a lot of chemistry. I don't agree with hooking up with the co-workers, but I think they have a lot more chemistry than him and Gina. Obviously, they make things incredibly awkward. I guess it would be a love triangle slash love square. Well, one thing's for sure. They would be the best dressed couple known to man. And since we're talking about fashion, let's break down this week's looks. Fashion. All right, we have a lot this week because, again, my girl Trudy, who is always the best dressed anyway, then match that with Giancarlo Esposito and then Crockett throwing some looks. It's hard. Obviously, everyone is amazingly dressed in this episode. My personal favorite looks for a wild card, no doubt, are going to go to my pimp daddy friend in the blue blazer, blush pink undershirt, Panama hat, outside of his quote-unquote legitimate business. Then, my other wild card runner-up is the cut-off baseball tee guy with, I wonder if it's a wig? You have to see this hair. It's kind of like curly Hulk Hogan hair. For last, for best dressed gentlemen, this was very tough because everything Adonis did warned my heart. The purple suit, I think, is going to be the runner-up. My top choice is going to be the gunmetal gray suit for Adonis. And then for Crockett, it has to be the soft yellow, purple pink undershirt, and the blue pants. Then for my girl Trudy, I love, 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 love that pink belted dress that she wears to the King of Babylon party. And then... Let's get into some vice tea. I'll explain a little bit about who that King of Babylon was. So that gentleman singing King of Babylon, that is David Johansson, previously a member of the New York Dolls and the Saturday Night Live house band. And under the pseudonym of Buster Poindexter, he released more music, most notably Hot, 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 which as soon as I say that will be stuck in your head for weeks. I do apologize. And the first live performance of the episode was performed by Clavant Derricks. I recognized him, and I was looking through his IMDb, The Outer Limits, because being a Canadian syndicated show, it was on TV all the time growing up. But he's also a Tony Award-winning stage actor and singer, and as we can see, he's got some gorgeous pipes. I really liked him in this role. I think he was a great counter to Trudy. Super handsome, super charming, and you can totally see why you wouldn't be able to listen to certain songs after breaking up with him. And then that pushy IA guy, that is David Proval. I recognize him because I just saw Mean Streets for the first time about a month ago. So I recognize him from that. That was actually his first role. And then you'll probably know him from Everybody Loves Raymond and, of course, the Miami Vice connection to The Sopranos, The Sopranos. Okay, to add on to that fun fact... David Proval, I just went to his IMDb. He was born in 1942, and he's still regularly acting. He has yearly credits, and he has films in pre-production. Wild. 80 years old. Wild. And then our favorite guest star of all, Giancarlo Esposito. No vice tea on him. He is perfect in every way. If there's anything ever bad about him, I don't want to see it. Don't want to hear it. And let's break down music. It's kind of tough when I was thinking, like, what's my favorite song from this episode? I really like the song that David was singing as Trudy's watching him, which I thought is Love is the Same. It's actually called Love is for Sale. <laughs> but I also really liked Women by Forder. Um, so I guess those were kind of like my two ties. But yes, it's Love is for Sale sung, of course, by Clavant Derricks, and then Women by Foreigner in the opening intro where they're just talking about different types of women. I just thought it was like a very clever use of the song and very on point with that montage. And then I'm going to question this. I'm seeing online that they're crediting Diamond Field by Pat Benatar when it's 
in my opinion, that weird heartbreaker demo from Heart of Darkness because I actually listened to the entire song, entire, the entire length of Diamond Field by Pat Benatar, and it did not sound like it did during the, the shootout and the chase scene. So I'm going to question that. Maybe it was later on the episode, I just totally missed it, and it wasn't included in part of my clip, so who knows. Then, Who to Listen To by Amy Grant as Trudy is walking along. That is our cheesy montage song. And then, of course, like I just mentioned, David Johansson singing live The King of Babylon. So I think my winner for this episode... <sighs> I'm very tied. I don't know if it should be Women by Foreigner or Love is for Sale, but I think I'm going to go Women by Foreigner. And I do have bad news. As much as we love Michael Mann casting, the third and final guest appearance by Giancarlo Esposito was in this episode. He doesn't appear on Miami Vice again. I do apologize to end the episode on a bummer. But next week, we have another great guest star, my personal favorite Sex in the City boyfriend, Ajax from The Warriors, Dexter's hot dad, James Remar, is guest starring on Buddies that will be breaking down the next episode of Vice and Easy. And again, thank you so much for listening to Vice and Easy. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for telling your friends. Thank you for upvoting me on the gallery. Thank you for liking all my TikToks and sharing them. I'm having a little bit of trouble with YouTube shorts. Just don't think it's the audience for me. But I want to thank you all for your support. I'll have more Vice Tea specials in the future. And we will be recapping some more as we get through the rest of season two. Thank you again for hitting that like button, that subscribe button, saying it to a friend, liking my TikToks, liking my Instagram posts, liking, upvoting my gallery. It all means a lot to me. We want to see this podcast grow and do good things. And I want to be able to give you guys the content that you want. So thank you again for all the great reviews, all the positive comments and all the positive feedback. You can find me everywhere social at Vice and Easy Podcast and see the gallery in the description of the episode or at viceandeasypodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. And as always. Hey, man, Miami Wise is number one new show.